So when wax moth go through comb, they leave a little, they leave their silk in a little straight line, a trail through the comb, and it's really identifiable. So that's what you're actually looking for. I can't believe that there's 15, I mean, it's not that I can't believe it. I, I do believe what you're saying, but it's unusual for, you, for me to be hearing you say you had 15 wax moth larvae on your drop board and no sign of them at all in your colony. That's, that would be an unusual circumstance. Hmm. Okay, yeah. So, so something doesn't make much sense to me, but maybe you can figure it out when you go back in. Yeah. I mean, I, we put the board back in. I pulled it again yesterday and I took off maybe um, four. And then today I put it back in and then I pulled it today and I took out, there was only one. Yeah. Well, um, so is the colony strong or weak? Very strong. So they're keeping the wax moth, wherever those wax moth are coming from, right? They're keeping them out of the colony. <clears throat> okay. All right, they, they could be living down below on your, near your bottom board, near your okay. wax moths. All right, so, all right, so you gotta take a, you know, take a little closer look at what's going on inside that colony. Just make sure that none of the comb is being affected by those wax moth. And, and even if you do have a drop, which is sort of an alarming drop, I would, um, I would not worry about it if there was no comb damage, because that's the whole thing, right? Okay. We, we try to keep wax moth out of our colonies because they will damage the comb. If it's a very strong colony and somehow wax moths are actually um, <clears throat> getting a foothold in and around above the screen, but around the peripheral of your colony down near the base, then uh, that's, that's that's just what's happening and it's fine. Okay. For, uh, for the rest of you, if you are actually experiencing some uh, damage, comb damage, and mostly you will, in a very strong colony, you won't see comb damage in the colony itself, but you will see comb damage in your stored comb. And that's the stuff you want to protect at this point. You want to make sure you get that frozen. Bill, I think we started recording after you showed the slide of the wax moth larva and counting the legs. So for, for purposes of the recording and folks who will see it later, would you mind putting that up again and to show folks? And uh... So that's a wax moth larva right there. All right, so you've got, there's the seven legs, wax, W-A-X, moth. So here he goes, M-O-T-H, right? Wax moth, right on the bottom. Small hive beetle larva um, looks like this. Let me see. Small hive beetle. Whoops. Small hive beetle larva. Okay. Do you see that? No, that's still the wax moth. Really? Yep. Okay. Hold on. There see you that? Go. Yep. No legs. Here's the first three pro legs. One small hive beetle. Nothing else. See? No other little pro legs like you saw in the wax. Line. But you can see they're almost identical. Now, if you're really observant, you'll note that there's a set of spines that go down the back of a small hive beetle, right? Making them even more insidious than they actually are if they take hold in your colony these guys will just destroy your whole colony. Right? Wax moth, we don't really are concerned with as long as our colony is strong. And small hive beetle will eventually overcome even a strong colony. And if they're all reproducing in your yard, it's a bad thing. All right, so that's what we're doing with those two. And so that was a question we had, but I wanna start off with another share of the bloom calendar and what's going on in June, this is one of my favorite parts of, uh, of um, 
beekeeping. Now, can you see that? Yes. See in my, my uh, bloom calendar right here. Let me move it around a little bit. And so you're going to actually focus on this part of it. May is gone. All right. Now, there might be some beauty bush around <coughs> left in bloom, but it's just about over at this point. Beautiful, bright orange pollen comes back into your colony from the beauty bush. And, and so I want you to just look at June and see what is left to come out and what has already come out. So let's take a look at, um, these are botanicals, but down here we have privet. Big bees will kill that. It's, and it comes out pretty much um, all over the place. And um, native viburnum is out. Already just out. Lavender, of course, is, a, is a, as I mentioned, is a pre bird's foot, trefoil, and crown vetch. Both are bird's foot trefoil will be worked by bees at points, but not often. And crown vetch is generally a bumblebee um, food. Uh, Canada thistle is out. Poison ivy, big flow this year. Now, poison ivy is uh, not something you normally would consider a source for your colony, but believe me, the way it flowered this year, if there's poison ivy anywhere near your property, and there probably is, and you have the uh, flowering plant, it will, it will, it'll be consumed by your bees. Makes no difference. Uh, they don't bring poison ivy back to the colony. It will not uh, give you a, a, a it won't, you won't break out from the honey they produce every year. There's a certain amount of poison ivy honey, uh, a pollen in my honey. So, um, I know that my bees collect enough nectar from poison ivy almost every year for it to make it into my, uh, my product. So, you know, it's not all consumed. I'm gonna skip up to the top. Hollies were out. Hollies are another big, big American holly trees uh, are another big draw. They came out early in June. And then today, the big winner today is smooth sumac. Now smooth sumac, if you have a stand of this anywhere near your property, your bees, and I'm sure there's sumac in almost every location in Connecticut, maybe smooth. Um, <clears throat> it is a huge nectar source and flow for your colonies. So you can see just what's already happened in June. I, I'm sorry I have these out of date order, but I just happened to add them in, in, in haphazard way. Then later on, I, I changed this and make at, later in the year, I'll, I'll make this all, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll straighten out the timeline. But following, Smooth sumac will come will be staghorn. That's more common than than uh, smooth. So you have a, a sustained sumac flow from about now until June 20th. That's a good and well after June 20th, 21st in my bloom calendar. That staghorn will stay up for about a week. So you've got right from now till the end of June, you've got two beautiful flows for your bees. Not to mention that coming on real soon is dogbane, common milkweed, blackberry, and the thistles. All right, so all of these sustainer flows will, will, um, will get, you can make honey off of them if there's large enough quantities or big fields around it. So, hey, yeah. Can I ask you about another plant? What do you, sure. What do you think about catalpa? It's big it's, blooming now. Yeah. So, um, hi, Ralph. Glad to see you. Ralph, Ralph's coming in from California. He's got that shirt on. Look at his shirt he's got. Oh, on. man, I'm in New York. Galifoot. Where are you? Back in New York. We, hold on. You're supposed to be quarantined. We let you in? Oh, man. I told him my name was Bill Hesbeck. <laughs> Welcome back to New York. And you get smarter right away as soon as you land, right? I mean, it's not. Yeah, right. It doesn't take very long to no, shake no. that California thing off. So anyway, um, Catalpa. Catalpa is not worked, in my opinion, by bees. There are some people who think honeybees. And the reason I don't think it's worked by honeybees, not that it can't be, but there's too many com uh, competing blooms for it. And it's not out in Connecticut yet. Did you see it out where you are? I saw it in Kingston, New York this afternoon, all along the Hudson River. So that's even further north. All right, so, but I'm not seeing it on my trees. I have a, um, 
I have a, you know, a, a specimen tree I look at. I yes, full seen. bloom here. Okay, so maybe I, I missed it. But so I think that that's possibly a plan I should add to the bloom calendar. But I'm, I, you know, I, I'm hesitant unless I actually see a bee um, on it. Bumblebees, I know work it. So I could put that with a bumblebee note. But yeah, that's out. And then also, I, I failed to mention that right around June, small leaf linden came out. Small leaf linden is a cultivar, but those trees grow massive and they put out extraordinary blooms, but they're not worked anywhere near as, as, as hard as basswood is. And basswood will be out um, right in the beginning of July. And that's, uh, you know, I have on my, my you can see my, um, my notes that I had from 2000, whatever I, whenever I carried over that um, basswood bloom, it was a year where it didn't bloom at all. So weather conditions can be such that basswood does not produce flowers and, and uh, bloom at all. But when it does, a single flower on a basswood bloom can, is enough, can hold enough nectar. It's a little tiny cup, looks like a lotus, and it can hold enough nectar to fulfill the needs of an of a individual forager. They can go there, get one flower, get all the nectar out of it and come back to the colony, be satisfied. It's an extraordinary um, nectar producer, right? So June is a big month. That's why we leave our supers on in June because our colonies still build honey in June. And that in July, you can see the big, there's gonna be a lot of un interesting stuff that comes out in July. <clears throat> um, and you're gonna see, uh, um, I still have some, other June blooms way down low. Then I have to move up. You can see there's white still be here. These are all cultivars, but um, bees work them like crazy. Any questions Bill, on the bloom calendar? Bill, this is Marta. Um, I have a question about linden because I have lin I have seven huge linden trees around and I think they will be blooming much sooner than July this year. They pretty much are almost opening up in my area in Simsbury. And one more comment on that, friend of mine in Avon, he has also linden trees. He said that the, the, the tree started uh, shedding the flowers two weeks ago. Um, so, so definitely was too dry. And he noticed a lot of aphids and he just collected some honey, uh, which was very dark. And I know from Poland, there is a linden leaf honeydew honey which I think he was able to get. No, that's so, interesting. Yeah, I, I, I did some research because I tasted the honey. Definitely, it's, it's very different. But honeydew, maybe from the um, evergreens, but also linden tree um, with aphids can produce it. So something I, I just learned recently. Yeah, um, well, you know, I, I don't get a dark honey this time of year, but so I, know. I don't think I get much honeydew in it. But I might. Now, so what you're bringing up is a point that I want everyone to hear is that <clears throat> this is my bloom calendar and it's for Cheshire, Connecticut under the conditions that I commonly experience in this area. Now, as, as Ralph pointed out, there, there are blooms. There's plenty of little microclimates around in the state and your uh, mileage may vary. Uh, if you have a copy of this bloom calendar, which I've shared a few times, um, you can fill these dates in for yourself. So I should have clarified that before, but now I'm doing it. So these are my dates, but they're very, they're going to be very close to yours. And, um, and I'm surprised to hear that the linden, um, the phonology of that linden, wherever it was, uh, was so different because that usually is pretty consistent. It goes by degree days before it blooms. So in degree days are a calculation that's, that are, that's made every year from, and in our case, it's made uh, by Cornell's laboratory and Cornell's weather stations. And I have one right near me in an apple orchard and they will tell me how many degree days it is. And what I'll do on my bloom calendar for Linden this year, since uh, you mentioned it, is I will calculate, I will insert, there's a column on my bloom calendar that's empty, but I've, I've put it aside for, 
for degree days. And what would be really nice is if I could figure out for each one of these plants how many degree days it was before they, till they bloomed. And uh, then, you, then you know for sure exactly what's going on. And, and Bill, to your point, I usually get, last year was very dry, so it was different, but normally it starts the end of Ju uh, June, beginning of July. So you, your dates are very similar to normally what happens. This year, it seems like everything is blooming a little bit earlier, so. Well, you know, I, I have two specimen linden trees and I'm so encouraged with them this year because they are putting up, and like, like I said, everything in my area where I am has bloomed in what I would consider their, it's all, their ultimate capacity. Even, as I mentioned earlier, poison ivy. I showed, I showed the poison ivy bloom to about half a dozen folks that I know are uh, into um, you know, the, the, the flora around our area. And I asked, and so, a couple of them are local farmers. And I asked them if they ever saw a poison ivy. This is all anecdotal stuff. I, I asked them what they thought of that bloom and they said they'd never seen anything like it. So, but I've seen that now with everything. It started with maple copters coming off the maple trees. People were using their snow shovels to pick them up. And, and that, you know, so, so, you know, we're in some kind of a cycle, I think we can count on really, really intense blooms. And I'm hoping for a big linden bloom because for some reason, there's two plants in my mind <laughs> that have taken taken over. One is one is a black locust and the other one is basswood. And I love black locust doesn't have much flavor as a honey, but it just it's it's water white. It's there's nothing at all in it. It's just water white. And then Linden has a has a wonderful um, uh, how would you explain it? Uh, a lime flavor to it. So it adds this wonderful um, backdrop of lime so cool Bill, anything else on the bloom calendar i just wanted to mention that that uh, there's a nice adjunct to the bloom calendar in the sort of the pollen calendar with the pollen identification colors that you can look up on wikipedia it's it's pretty general but it's also a nice uh uh view into what's going on in the plant world yeah i so i i started that Whenever I see something that I can identify as, as a color, I will put it in this colony, a column here. I haven't been as, as vigilant in that column, column as I should be or could have been. And I was hoping that by sharing this a number of times, folks would start to fill that in and we could have, you know, like a community calendar that would have um, some of those um, colors filled in, which would be nice because I want to mention that pollen on a plant. If you were to take, say for instance, uh, any, any pollen and shake it on your, on your, uh, on a black cloth or any, any place, put it on the fender of your car if it's dark enough, you'll see the color. But it doesn't look that way on a bee's uh, hind legs, on its pollen basket, because what a bee does is that bees add nectar to pollen to get it to the right viscosity so it'll stick to the pollen basket and and that changes the color a little bit it doesn't change it won't change it from orange to blue but it will change the shade of orange so you know you can make a little note of it because when it gets to the door or the landing board on your colony and they're going in the entrance with it you want to be able to figure out if it's actually the pollen that you saw um, in the plant so you can, you can make an adjustment, a mental adjustment. What else? Anything else? Did we kill that? We killed it. All right, so again, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna repeat myself and say that a bloom calendar is your friend and um, it will ease your pain about what it is your bees are about to forge on or if there's any forage around. We had some great, Hopefully some of you had some great rain over the last couple of days and, um, and we, should be, uh, we should be in for a good rest of June, hopefully. All right, so 
We're going to open it up, I guess, to questions. We did want to talk a little bit about swarm season is not over. And Rebecca, I saw you on here somewhere. Where are you? Yeah, I'm here, Bill. How are you? I'm good. So, um, so you had, oh, did you have the swarm? No, you had the- um, The buttons. The buttons, yeah. So you want to talk about what it is that's sure. on your mind about? Yeah, sure, go so, ahead. So um, on the 19th, I put in my drone boards and yeah. one of my hives already had it capped over. So I already removed that, but the other hive doesn't seem interested in them at all. Okay. They're somewhat drawn out, not, not completely. Um, the green color is a little harder to see the egg inside. I haven't seen much activity on there at all. But the one that did have capped brood already, um, once I scraped it all off and put it back in clean, um, they started to rebuild comb immediately, but I saw three buttons in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of wondering, was that like in almost response to what I had done? Nope. Oh. No, they uh, don't, they're not, they don't care what you do. Okay. They only, <laughs> they only care what you do when you do something that makes them want to sting you. It's yeah. Like I, I mean, I saw, on a drone frame. I, I saw the yeah, you could. Yeah, you they they could put buttons on the drone frame. Yeah, yeah I, I, I kept researching it and I didn't see too much of other people just out in the internet world discussing that. And yeah, so no, that's yeah, no, that that's just something that they did on that frame. No. Okay. Um so that colony, so the question that those buttons would indicate is are those is that colony ready to swarm or preparing to swarm? Well, I hope not. I just put them in on Mother's Day. They're brandy new. Yeah. See, so it's not. It's probably not likely that it means any that it's about to swarm. So okay. So that uh, maybe leads to that other question. Go ahead. Um, so I have lost your audio, Rebecca. We totally lost Rebecca. Maybe she muted her brains up there. Should I add a super? Oh, so we missed a whole part of that. Oh, I'm sorry. Should I say it again? Yeah. Oh, I apologize. Um, so I have one and a half empty frames in one top brood box of a hive. Should I um, add a super? So what, what do you mean by adding a super for honey production? Well, I, I guess like, I don't, I don't, this is my first season doing it. I just thought that after you got about 80% of your um, brood box drawn, I added my second brood box. And now that is almost, it's more than 80% drawn. So I was wondering if I should add, I have a, a, a medium super that came with my package. Yeah. Just was wondering, is it is it time or not this year at all? Or yeah, no, it's a it's a very good question. It's a very good question. Thanks for asking it. Um, well, so if your bees are still in the mood, you're still feeding them, correctly? Yes, I am, sir. All right. So um, if you add, if you put a super on and you you would still feed them, so you, you're going to have your all your double deeps filled. Mm -hmm. at this point. All right. I would, I would wait if I were you for a little while, you're past, you know, we've got some great sustaining blooms left to come in June and, and also till the end of July, but it's not usually a major flow. The only time it would be a major flow is if, for instance, you have a big sumac stand near you and you have a big linden stand and then you, and then you might actually make some honey this year. You can make honey on a package, especially if it's behaving like yours in the first year. If you wanna to try to add that medium super and you see if they're gonna draw out comb, you're gonna to have to stop feeding at that point. Okay. You can put your queen excluder on mm -hmm. and see if they'll come up there and draw comb. Okay. All right, I, I mean, I guess I could give it a try. Now that was my other question. Um, um, I, I had, had a, a, observing, observing a bee, a bee on my paper and I did see a mite, so I know soon I have to do my first wash. So if I were to use the Formic Pro, do I still feed 
with a bucket feeder if I did form No, no, okay. they, they recommend that you don't feed during uh, during treatment. Okay, and when, and I, when do I do the, the treatment, 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 I, I don't, um, open, open the box, the box. Right? I just leave them for the 10 day treatment. Well, you you um you went into some kind of like um uh, a twilight zone uh, <laughs> echo chamber. Oh there, no, which, again. No, it gave me a great flashback, but you know, the thing <laughs> is I just couldn't I couldn't understand you, you know, like I'm sorry. Seems like uh there's somebody named Anthony, uh, and we were hearing you and him at the same time. So if, okay. if, if you've got two devices on, that's that's the echo we're getting. Yeah. I only have a device. I only, I'm the only one home except for the dog barking. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I asked if I put the Formic Pro on, if my numbers show me that I need to treat, do I put that on and then close up the box and that's it, right? I walk away for the 10 days. I don't touch them or peek at them, right? Right. You okay. don't touch them or peek with them and read those instructions on the label. Yes, sir. And make sure you follow them. That's okay. all you, you have to, the, that's all you you have to do. Take the bucket feeder off. Yes, they, they recommend that you don't feed during their treatment. Okay, so when do you think I would read? Well, I could revisit the idea of a, of a super or possibly wait. And what, what would I wait for? What, when would I know it's time? Well, so, so this is the art of beekeeping. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the art of beekeeping. And so how you know when it's time? Well, if you don't have, if, if the bees need the space, they will draw out some frost wax on the top combs and you'll see that the that the um, honey bands on the in the top box will begin to get pure white on the edges that means that they're likely still in the business of wanting to draw comb it's a little bit getting a little bit late in the season for bees to draw to draw comb but they can mm -hmm. at this time of year so you can so then you would just try it but you have to you have to look uh, you know, a little deeper into the literature on what frost wax looks like and how do, like, how do I know when my bees are ready to draw comb? And that, okay. that's the indication. When a colony gets to the point where they are packed with honey and they have no space to put it in, they will begin to broaden the shoulders on the honey band and you'll see it, it'll be pure white. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you leave it longer than that, they'll, they'll draw a comb between the top bars and the top box and the bottom of your inner cover. And you'll pull that up and it'll be full of honey. That's how you know you missed. That's how you know okay. you missed the sun. I have seen when I take my inner cover up, um, the little, the space hole where that my bucket feeder fits on sometimes is full of wax. Of, of yeah, and I I mean I guess like a burr cone kind of thing is what I would yeah think. that's just because you have a bucket feeder on okay sir okay but that'll occur with incoming nectar yep if, if it has a, you're right it has yes sir there. it right? has done all so right I'm very good thank you Bill are right, you gonna have to experiment and, and wow and you're gonna have to um uh you know you're gonna have to get more familiar with this is your first year doing great just keep doing it thank, thank you. you. Bill, I, I have a follow-up question to that. This is Anthony. Um, I installed my uh, first year beekeeper. I installed my packages uh, middle of April. Um, I'm using medium supers. Um, I brood, put brood. My, I'm sorry? For a brood, brood. And excuse me, I put my third super on, my third medium super, on two weeks ago. Um, so, so, Anthony, let me, just, just so, so I know. I know. Why am I Bill, Bill, we're, we're, we're getting the uh, uh, echo. You, you. Not, not from the not, 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 Oh, so somebody, somebody else, else is giving Is everybody else's else mic, mic off? off? Kevin, Kevin, can you turn your mic off? I went to a different room, so is this better? Well, well I, I know. Somebody's, somebody's feeding 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 back, back on, on me, me somewhere. somewhere. I don't know where you are. Um, so I don't know where you are. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. I think that Anthony, 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 Anthony,
All right, that's, All right, that's the person. person. Who is, Who is it? it? Let's go find that. All right. Oh, everybody, oh, everybody is muted. muted. No, no. Galaxy, Galaxy Tab, Tab S2. S2. Who is, Who is Galaxy, Galaxy Tab, Tab X2? X2? All right. All right. Oh, no, that didn't work. I keep, I keep seeing, seeing, I keep I keep seeing, seeing markers, markers springing, springing, lighting, lighting up, up. As, as if, um, um, but, but it's, but it's I mean, is this any better? better? No. No. You were about to ask me a question. No fair, I forgot. I, ha I have three medium supers. I put the third one on two weeks ago. When okay, I'm about to ask, about to ask you a question. question. Yes, that's what I was asking you, what there was. Okay. okay. Mute, Mute your, mic. your mic. All right, so the question I'm asking you is, what are you talking about when you say super? Do you mean the third brood box? because mediums require three brood boxes for bees, or are you talking about a honey super to make honey? Three brood boxes. Okay, great. So let's keep that terminology straight. So you're, you're gonna add your third medium brood box. Okay, okay what's, your, what's question? your question? I added it two weeks ago, the third medium brood box. I went in yesterday, everything was drawn out. There were eggs in the top brood box, all the comb was drawn in the top brood box. So um, I took off my hive top feeder, put a queen excluder on, and put um, a honey super on top of that. With It's just foundation. It's not drawn out. My question is, I had Apivar strips in for six weeks, and I took them out yesterday. It was the sixth week. What do I do with the... If I get honey, does that have to be discarded? Should I give it back to the bees from the new honey super? All right. Okay, good. Thank you for muting. Um, so what you have to do is follow the instructions on the ape of R. What did this instruction say? I read that ape of R two weeks, it, you have to have it out for two weeks before you collect any honey. I don't know if that's, with comb already present because there is no comb there. Now I know op epivar supposedly can go into the comb too, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I should, but what do I do with this if it does get filled up with honey? Should I just take the queen, queen excluder off and just let them use it for brood? I mean, the queen that has this colony, she's going nuts. She must have been uh, on fertility drugs or something. It's just going gangbusters. Yeah, this is this is so you just you're a new beekeeper just nod your head isn't that true anthony you're a new beekeeper and you got this queen with what a package or something yeah i mean the best thing to do with this queen is just let me know where you live i'll come over and get it because the thing is uh you know like uh, this is a queen that i should have don't, don't do it, do it any, any, don't don't listen listen to him. Him. i've had several offers of that already my mentor wants to take her a friend of mine who lost his bees last year wants to take her I don't know. I, you know, go ahead. I mean, you can give it to one of them if you want. I mean, you know, I'm going to make sure she's alive. No, you got a nice queen, got a great colony going. And like, um, like the other folks that are talking about getting really quick builds, you might be in a great area where there's plenty of blooms this year. Now, other folks that do this for a living and know exactly how to make honey in up and down the East Coast are all saying that playing the same tune. This is an extraordinary year for honey. Now we're talking, I'm talking about all the way up and down the East Coast, all the way up into the Maritime and, and into Canada. So people are saying that this is an extraordinary year, year to make honey. But of course, you know, and sometimes that phenomena does occur. It happens on the whole East Coast. And this year, people can make a lot of honey. In my case, I had all my supers filled 
in June, and that's not usual, right? That doesn't usually occur until the end of July for me also. So in my case, but I have all drawn comb. Um, it's been a good year. So what they mean is you cannot extract, you can't have honey supers on with Apivar. That's number one. Then I think what, the way I interpret Apivar's instructions is you have to wait two weeks before you would put supers on and then start to collect the honey if you still can at that point. But I think they were at the point where there was no one else, nowhere else for them to go. I mean, the, I, you know, there was eggs in the top super. There was, they were filled with um, pseudo honey because I've been feeding them up until I, this, up until yesterday. So yeah, yeah. I didn't want them to disappear. So that's why I put it up there. Well, but, well you didn't, you didn't do, anything. do anything. Okay. Okay. You, gotta you, gotta yourself. you didn't do anything wrong. You just can't use that, legally can't use that honey for sale. It's, you gotta remember, Apivar is a neurotoxin and it's, and it's, lipo, it's lipophilic, which means that it's, it's an oil-based product. I mean, wax is lipophilic. So it will get into the comb and stay in the comb, but after a while it dissipates out. So it's not, um, it's not harmful forever, but you, but you know, the FDA has said it's not permissible to use uh, use that product when you have honey supers on because of because of the cross contamination of that um, neurotoxin and a certain amount of it chemicals and so would get into the honey so it's not a good thing to do so you, so, you, it, so it's okay that you have that um, that on there just don't eat the honey what would you suggest I do with it take the queen excluder off and let him use it for brood. Well, it doesn't matter if the queen excluder is on or not. Just leave it on. See if they draw it out and make honey. And you, then you, just discard it or? No, no, you don't have to discard it. You feed it back to them. It's fine. Find Thank out what's you. going on with, with your audio, Anthony. All right. What else we got? Sylvia. Hi, I think Ralph might have answered my question, but I am um, chatted me. But I've got, I had to combine a weaker laying worker hive. This was, it was a fun few weeks. Yeah. And then um, I had to, so it was a laying worker hive. So I, after I did a shake of them, and then I actually had them all come back to a weak hive and I, stacked it on top of my stronger hive, which has two brood boxes. So now I have three brood boxes, but probably only half of those frames are, you know, really drawn and have brood. Um, can I downsize? Can I go ahead after I, I plan on checking on them? I newspapered them. So I'm waiting for them to kind of hopefully not Bye. kill my queen. And then, um, but when I go in and check, can I take out, you know, the undrawn frames, uh, you know, undrawn frames that don't have anything on them and then try downsizing it down to two brood boxes? Um, well, yeah, so what'll, what'll occur is there'll be brood that'll be scattered throughout. Now, yeah. you know, throughout the con, but you probably won't have more than eight or nine frames in total mass wise that have um yeah because i had just put on the stronger hive i had just put the second brood box on and it was it probably had two frames in there and then my weaker hive didn't really have anything right it had yeah. a mess so um i could take out could i take everything out of the weaker hive and get those bees i assume i could try moving or shaking them in and then getting them down to two hives two boxes otherwise i've got a pretty inefficient set of three boxes, right? Yeah, um, so what you can do with any, whenever you're in a situation like you're in, you can take and put a queen excluder between the brood boxes. The queen won't go up there and lay. The brood will emerge out of any given box you wanna remove. And then you'll have an open, without losing any of the brood, you'll have an open box you can use for anything. 
some lots of times if you do that, if you put, if you have two colonies, if I'm reading this question right, I'm not really sure if I'm following it completely, right? But um, you're looking now the brood when you want to consolidate these three boxes into two. Are there little cap drones in one of them from the laying worker colony? Yeah, I've taken those frames out. So I took like what the laying workers were doing. Yeah. And I took those frames out before I combined the hives. I took those out and I froze them. Okay. So you want to, um, so what you're really. So I've got a lot it. of empty hives in my weak hive, right? I've got a, a lot of empty frames. Yeah. At my point. So I'm just trying to figure out rather than have, you know, a bunch of empty frames, can I, I want to get it down to two supers. Yeah. And, and not supers, two brood boxes. Yeah, two brood boxes. But you wanted to save the bees, right? Yeah, yeah. That was the, otherwise I chuck all those weak hive. <laughs> I was ready to, <laughs> to dump the you, weak hive. <laughs> you were ready to like, get rid of them. <laughs> oh, God. So, yeah, right, I so, just wanted to salvage what I could. And so I'm just trying to figure out how to get them all into two brood boxes okay. at this point. Yep. Yeah, so, where are you with the paper unite? Well, I'm a couple days in. I, I, I did this over on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I was going to wait until uh, Saturday and, and go see. But I'm guessing they've gotten through the paper because at the, the bottom board, I could see little scraps of paper and stuff. So, yeah. so, the, the, so, the, so the colonies, yeah, the colonies are definitely combined by now. Go in there and shake all the bees out of whatever box you want to remove. Shake them all out and... Um, Put them into two boxes so you can Did go you shake there them outside of the box and they'll no, go right in top of the box on so, top okay you know shake them right on the top bars um and they'll go in and they'll just go down you know okay. if they're okay. nurse bees they'll go down and you did something to you did a little maneuver to to try to eliminate the laying workers right what did you do <laughs> i um well we tried a few different things but eventually well, what i did do was I went down, out several yards. I shook my boxes, right? My frame. I emptied yeah. out my frame and, and emptied out my boxes. Yeah. So hopefully, I got rid of my laying workers in that way. So um, the theory with a laying worker is so. T can you explain your theory for people who may so, have missed that little thing? Huh? Okay, so yeah, you mean what did I figure out over these last few weeks? Is that what yeah, so so why did you do so why did you do that is the question. So my understanding is that I had so I, I was queenless for four weeks um after I installed my package and I tried putting my queen in. After um my first queen didn't make it, I tried requeening. She didn't make it and I ended up with a lot of drone cells, um, concluding that I probably had a laying worker, which is laying uh, worker bees that have uh, started laying unfertilized eggs. So I was getting a lot of drone um, cells in my frames. Um, the reason behind that being that there weren't enough, there weren't pheromones that the queen would usually give off. Without those pheromones, their ovaries kick in and they start laying unfertilized eggs. Um, they, because they are not foragers or they don't know their way home from what I understand, um, I, I probably went a little beyond the usual 30 yards, uh, which I don't recommend to anyone because they get really angry. Um, so they were angry bees. Yeah. Um, and so I had a pretty hot hive. I uh, put it on a truck, drove down less than probably a, a quarter of a mile. And then frame by frame, I shook them off. I got them, I got, I emptied out my brood box. Um, actually took even the bottom board. So I, I brought everything, I closed it up and then I drove it down and then I shook off all of the frames and um, and they were not happy. And then uh, brought back empty frames and empty box and put it back where they originally were, hoping that my foragers and my non-laying workers would come back, which from they how did. Many, from how far away? Probably a quarter of a mile. It was down down to part of my driveway. And so did some come back? Yep. So I ended up with, I gave it a day. So I had a bunch of bees come back. Um, I was hoping, I hope that my laying workers did not. 
and then I went with the second approach, which is then I um, took that brood box, and I thankfully, to the advice of my classes, I do have two hives, so I have another hive that is a stronger hive, and that has been doing well. So I put newspaper in between. So I put in, I put a newspaper on top of my stronger hive, and then I took my weaker hive box and I stuck it on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the idea is that that gives them a little time to nibble or break through the newspaper and not um, being angry and not, oh, the other point is, is land workers will kill your queen because, uh, so I, I wanted them to have a little bit of time to get used to each other and get the, the sense sent, I think, through the newspaper. And then hopefully they have not, I think there's no angry bee so far. So hopefully they have, successfully combined. All right. So so now but I have like like I said I have a weaker the weak hive had very few frames. I have three boxes. I'm just trying to I wanted to to try uh getting it down to two brood boxes because that's probably all I have of really solid frame. Yeah you know, with stuff on it. Okay. So um but the other but that box is drawn, right? The one that you're that doesn't have a lot in it, but it's drawn comb, isn't it? There's quite a bit, but they there was some comb, but yeah, no, there was like no uncapped syrup, maybe a little bit of cap syrup in there. Yeah, okay. But so got, I don't yeah. think I had any real egg laying, no larvae going on there. So oh, good. So just shake the bees into the two boxes that you want them in. Okay. And you're done. Thank you very much. I impulsively did buy another nuke um, <laughs> at the time after after seeing that I had a. A, a weak hive that I was combining. So now I'm in the process of hopefully getting a nuke to to build out before winter. We'll see. Yeah. So I mean, in in the, among beekeepers, we we try not to use that that word impulsive because we would just be saying it all the time. You know, it's like <laughs> I, I, all, it was a little embarrassing. A lot, oh wow! I, I I literally like I I it was like the dark. It was like the black market of messaging people trying to find oh, new know, within 15 minutes no. um 15 minutes um, bought a nuke and then i went and bought a, a whole hive box in like less than 30 minutes so yeah uh, no. <laughs> and then and on the way back you might climb 30 feet up in a tree because you saw a, a swarm you know i mean it, you know you never can tell you figure well i got the nuke box right in the back here i can just shake a minute you know it's like yeah now we do that all the time it's a lot of fun so okay, you're thanks, you're learning yeah. a whole lot about bees in your first year. Yeah, I think um and uh I, I make sure you duct tape any openings because uh, I had a very when you do apparently when you deal with a very defensive hive, they figure out every little gap if you didn't zip up properly on a full suit. <laughs> right. Um when I'm doing that, I want to I make sure that I put I mean it looks corny but you can use duct tape or put your socks over the top of your pants down below because they'll crawl up your leg and then everything has to be um, covered. You can't leave any holes or anything in your zippers. They have to- Yeah, they, they got through. I mean, they literally found like an opening. Yeah. It was, I, I mean, I have been, um, at least Stumbling. I'm not allergic. We did figure that out in the last four weeks. So. Okay, good. Yeah, so they'll get into every little nook and cranny and um, so, you, but if but the but the, if it's a bee jacket and it's properly made, if you have those little Velcro tabs down, no bee, it's bee proof. No bees will get in. Yeah. There. The only thing is, some of them have um, some of them have a, a Velcro strap around your wrist that you have to actually use. If that is open, bees will get into your arms, and then you know so. So on a really, uh, that's how you know a colony really is a little bit defensive when they're looking for all of those little holes to go into your bee jacket, you know, and they find them. All right, so good. Wonderful. Thanks. Okay, what else do we have? What do we got in here? Bill, quick one. After I've um, frozen one of these green drone frames, so full yes. drone, frozen, what's the best way to clean it off before I put it back in the hive? Okay, so now Rebecca had a little bit of an incident with this also, so it's it's good that we talk about it. Once it's, once it's drawn and capped, right? Our old theory was freeze it, 
and then put it back in the colony after it goes to normal, you know, freeze it for at least 72 hours. Bring it back to the colony and let the bees clean all of that stuff out. But what we're suspicious of in the last year or two, there's been an emerging discussion around whether or not that's a good healthy practice because what can occur is you're trying to trap Varroa in that drone frame. And you don't really know how many pupa were infected and how much, how, what virus load the Varroa that's in that pupa or, or in those cells feeding on the pupa. You don't know what kind of viral load you have. And yes, you killed the mites, but you will not kill the viruses. So if we feed it back, there's some thought now that it's probably not a good idea because you, you're actually working with the Varroa to vector viruses back into your healthy bees. So I would suggest that you use, get, now it's not a um, clean process. If you try to scrape it off, use a paint scraper or a hive tool, go right down to the rib, mid rib. I like to do that away from the colony. So you don't try to do that around the colony or near it or over it, because then it gets real messy and all that stuff's dripping down into the colony and you can make a mess out of it. And um, you have to make sure all the bees are off the frame also, you know, all brushed off and cleaned off or shook off or whatever, you know, whatever you do to have to get all of those bees off the frame and, and then bring it somewhere and scrape it over a pail or something like that. I have in my bee yard, I have a little, you know, it's like a Home Depot bucket. It's a regular five gallon bucket and uh, with a, you know, one of those tops that goes over it. And I have a uh, garbage bag inside of it and I just scrape it right over the top of that and, and uh, throw it all away and then put it back in a colony. And as Rebecca mentioned, you know, if it's a real strong colony, they'll build it back out again. So can I ask a virus question? Yeah. Can I, can I ask it? You go first. Let, 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 uh, let's let Dean finish, Ralph, then Sorry. don't forget that question because I know how your memory works, Ralph. Sorry, Ralph. You um, better write it down, Ralph. The other, the, other, the other suggestion that has been made to me is that I, I can wash them out, which would get rid of the things in there with, a, like a, with a, a garden hose, which would mean that they didn't have to rebuild the wax, which would save the bees effort. Um, so let me know how, you work, how that works. How, how would you uncap it? Uh, they're suggesting using like a honey uncapper to actually uncap it. I like, like run it down it. to uncap it and then spray it with a. I with a like this. I, Dean, I like this. Do it. I'll try but it if on you the can weekend. video I'm it. You've done it. <laughs> now, listen, if you can video this, it's mu it'll be much better. I mean, you know, look, beekeeping can get boring. We'll want to see this video. You just want to have a laugh. I will try. We'll want to see this video. No, I, it, it might work. You know, if you, but you got to remember a wax uncapper, you're not trying to cut through wax. You're trying to cut through silk and cocoon. Yep. And it doesn't work as well. Yep. But um, you can try it. It's a good thought. And if, um, you know, if it works, fine. The, I mean, the first, it was also suggested that if I, um, if I, if I cut the tops off the, the cocoons and left it out, that the birds would eat them, that absolutely did not work at all. Oh yeah, so that's not a beekeeper <laughs> that, that has ever no. tried that. that, <laughs> that I that already is, know that that's not I've a tried a few things already, so <laughs> I'll try this one, I'll let you oh, know. There's the, there's, the, there's the chicken theory, you know, where chickens will eat everything and all of that, so it's got a lot of fun. Ralph, is it possible that you were able to conjure up enough memory cells to re remember your virus question? Barely, I'm having a mental virus load. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, okay, Bill Nye, science guy. Go ahead. Uh, my, it was my understanding that viruses need to survive on a living organism. Right. And if you freeze the, if you freeze the uh, pupa for 72 hours. Yes. And you're freezing the mites for 72 hours. Would yes. the virus die as a result of not having a living organism to survive on? Nope. Now we got to remember that um, viruses in their vegetative state are inside cells doing damage. But when they, what, what happens is what they're trying to do, a virus is trying to do is assemble another virus particle 
So it uses the cellular machinery inside of the cell of the bee to make another particle. The particle has a capsid coating on it that's very durable, almost the same as a pollen coating. You know, on pollen, we call it um, exine. On viruses, we call it capsids, but they're the same. Polymers, uh, some of them have, um, uh, you know, a different lipid, like coronavirus has uh, our, our co SARS-CoV-2 has, um, you know, has a lipid uh, spike, protein spike with lipid on it. So that's a little bit vulnerable to the environment. But the kind of viruses that we're working about, worried about is the form wing virus. That's a little tiny 30 nanometer um, acosahedral capsule. And it has a very, very, very um, uh, protective coat. And they will survive as a particle, an infective particle. Just like um, you can get infected with influenza through the air, or you can get uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2 particle, it's it, that particle, through, through droplets and stuff like that. They can survive for a period of time outside the body. So can we go back to what we're going to do? We're going to scrape to Dean's question. Your suggestion is that we actually just scrape off. We freeze it for the 72 yeah. hours, and then we scrape it all off. Yeah. And then um, will that, I mean, you, I imagine it's still, you can't get a clean scrape, right? I mean, there's. Yeah, you can scrape one. it right down to the midrib and get everything off. OK. And then you can just wash it under. And what, with just a hive tool? You, just a hive tool comes right off. OK. You can use a little small paint scraper if you want also, but it'll, you know, like a little um, two inch or four inch paint scraper. Question for you. What happens if the whole thing is not capped? If it's only capped in the middle, do you wait for the whole frame to be capped or do you, can well, you just scrape off the cap part and put it back? Is that you, Anthony? Was that you that asked that question? Yeah, you yes. gotta wait. You gotta wait until like, okay, now you gotta mute yourself. You got another speaker on somewhere, Anthony. You just gotta look around and figure that out. You got a ring doorbell or something? You're not connected to me, are you? You got a ring doorbell? I hope you're not in the same neighborhood. You know, that's the big controversy with that ring doorbell. Now everybody's sharing bandwidth and all of that. So anyway- We um, just installed it as a matter of fact. I, that's what it is. All right, so look, um, yeah, you gotta wait until about 80% of that frame is capped before you start scraping it off. Now, uh, to, to Sylvia's point, it, try scraping it off when it's frozen, it'll be a lot easier. Bill, in my second hive, why do you think, why do you think they seem not interested in that drone board at all or that drone foundation at all? They're not the same genetics. They're just a different hive and they're behaving differently. And some will build out that comb. You have a really strong colony in that first colony. And, okay. and that's why they're doing what they're doing. And that's- So second, should I leave it in there? Still leave it in there for them to see if they- Yeah, yeah, leave it in. Okay. It's not doing any harm. No, okay. Hey, Bill? Yes. No, hi. A hi, question Bill. for you. Not sure. as interesting as the others, but a little background. About 10 days ago, I put on my second brood box. Things were looking great. Lots of pollen was coming in. It just looked wonderful, like the colony was growing. And then my neighbors on either side of me, both that week decided to spray for uh, mosquitoes and ticks. Two days ago, I'm walking out and in front of my hive, right at the entrance, it was like walking over a box of Cheerios with all the crunching dead bees under my feet. So it, it seemed like some people did respond and I asked what I should do. And um, it seemed like maybe a pesticide poisoning, something was obviously killing my bees. So that was one issue. The other issue I think I maybe had resolved with my mentor, <laughs> but uh, so Carol, are you, you have to make sure that that one that you saw the dead bees outside of wasn't starving. I don't think so because my feeder is still on. Okay. So the feeder is still on. 
that that's a good that well i mean that's that that makes that makes sense i up. make sure nobody starves okay. <laughs> now the theater's still on there was a lot of activity the colony looked like it was growing and i i go out every morning and i watch with my binoculars i'm like so did they, they so now you have to clean those dead bees up did you do that uh no i know that the pheromones are still there right no no no, no. you got to clean those dead bees up that are outside your colony Okay. And then you have to look and see if they're still dying. Okay. That's your, that's your first indication. These were still dying um, tonight. They're like laying on their back. And kicking. Yeah. yeah. And, and they were crawling in, were they crawling in the grass and looked like they couldn't fly? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably a pesticide kill. So. So these, 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 these properties connected to your property? They're right next door. All right, and they have little kids on one side. The owner of the other one just died, so who knows what who's going to be moving in? But there are children, and I can appreciate why they spray. Yeah, no, no. There's, there's, there's. But as a, are you a legitimate, like registered, and legal beekeeper in your? I sure am. All right, that's I, a good thing. I talked to Mark Crichton back in March. I love that. That's great. I am uh, registered. <laughs> So a pesticide company then, mm -hmm. you have to figure out who this was. Okay. And they are not allowed to, to spray um, on adjacent property to yours mm -hmm. without notification. Okay, they have not done right? that. Yeah, so they, they should have notified you that they were gonna spray. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're like one of the legitimate uh, spray companies, they, they will. They do not want to kill bees, you okay. know, so, um, yeah, but I think your bees got into something. I have no idea. It could have been overspray. You're saying they sprayed on the ground they, like a whole bug. They have spray. a, it, it literally comes out like a, a, like a fog. Yes. Some came out with a, like a fog. On the one side of me, they actually had, it looked like a, a, a time rake with stuff coming out. Um, yeah. It was so, both sides within a 10 day period. Okay. Um, and I knew, in fact, we could smell it. We were out in the yard. Working. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Could you we smell, could smell it? Smell it drifting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sad. So, yeah, anyway. that's a, and it, um, those are potent poisons. They're insecticides. Not sure what they actually sprayed, probably pyrethrum. Um, it could be some kind of, um, neonicotinoid, some kind of imidacloprid or something else. I don't know what they actually spread, but what they spread, sprayed was um, toxic enough to kill yeah. ticks and mosquitoes. Yeah. And, and that would also be toxic enough to kill your bees. Okay. Uh, would they, it, are, are the companies obli obli obliged to, to notify you? Like, does that suggest they go in the registry and see that they have registered beekeepers around? Well, I think, I think you have to notify them, Sylvia, first. Your obligation is to say to that particular- To the, the company. Yeah. So we would have to figure out who our neighbors right. has contracted and then notify them. But if they know, then they should be- Yes, then they should you. be, they should okay. be telling. Now, if you, if you went, if you could have caught them and said, Hey, what are you guys spraying today? Right. You know, I'm a beekeeper. I'm right over here. Then they would, then they would take some action. If it's a commercial operation, like an apple orchard, and let's say an yes. apple orchard actually, uh, it borders your property. Well, actually that one of them does. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. So that's more yep. likely the problem. That that's more likely the combination of a problem. So they an apple orchard will spray twenty two or thirty times a year. Well, they come up our road every morning with, with pest, well with their drums. They call it a pull tank. Okay, they come up with their pull tank. And is it spraying? They're at the top of the hill. The one behind us is a brand new orchard, so I haven't yeah. seen what they're spraying yet. My concern is, I did see, by the way, the names of the companies that were spraying on either side of me. I didn't recognize them. They seemed like kind of maybe like innovative new places. Yeah. Maybe get a picture of them next time they come because they're up here uh, on a regular basis. 
Yeah. Um, so, question then, Bill. so the commercial, the commercial, op, the commercial, if your border, if your property borders touch, mm -hmm. the apple orchard is obligated by law mm -hmm. to okay. tell you um, when they're going to spray. Okay. Um, next question, which hitchhacks on the one I'm talking about. But you're in a, hold on a second, um, Carol, before we go on. You're in an interesting situation. This is your first year, right? It is. So, so it won't be my last. <laughs> well, it oh, may be your here. last in that. It may be your last in that location. You have to evaluate this. We Go talked ahead. about that tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So, am I going to be? It's not looking hopeful then for the hive in my on my own property, based on what I've shared with you. Well, I don't know because I had huge pesticide kills in my apiary this year. Same thing. Um, Tens of thousands of bees I lost in, in all my production colonies. And I I gave the sample to the ag station for a tox, toxicology review. I haven't gotten the results back yet, but I suspect that uh, it was a tank mix, probably a dilution problem. When they make those mixes and put them in those tanks right. to spray them in orchards, they have a recipe. Right. You know, they have humectants, they have... Um, uh, surfactants, they have fungicides, and they have insecticides that they put in there. And they have to mix the ratios exactly right. And if they mix it too strong, it can kill your bees. Now, the problem is the bloom is over in those orchards. Mm -hmm. But the understory is filled with delicious stuff for bees. Usually, it's white Dutch clover at this point. It probably was daisies, um, uh, not daisies, uh, dandelions yeah. before that. And uh, but it could be anything that's in that understory, and your bees will work that. The problem is that the, the pull tank has spread its insecticide over the plants, but of course, it invariably drops in the understory uh, in between the rows, and that's where your bees get poisoned. And how about the pollen that my foragers are bringing in? Well, they're not, they're not, they're not pollen, they're not getting pollen from that orchard now. No, but they might oh, be getting. You else. mean from the from the understory? Yeah, anything they're bringing in. Yeah. They're, okay, so that also would be contaminated with pesticides, even it though would be, yes, good. if they're getting it from the understory, right? I mean, they were coming in like fast and furious. I mean, they were landing like dive bombing, loaded. Yeah. So you got to watch now and see what ha what happens to your colony. Like a lot of times, um, uh, you you will. Um, your queen will respond to that and, and lay brood like crazy. So what my bees have done is they've caught up. Mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, I lost you know, tens of thousands of bees that I shouldn't have lost out of all of my big production colonies, but my queens really backed up and, and produced a lot of brood because they were short on foragers and they were short on nurse bees. Okay. So when they, they got all of this brood for a moment because the queen's still laying, mm -hmm. the, col the colony tries to find a balance. And uh, she'll just keep brooding up. But I did notice in some colonies when it got really bad, there weren't enough nurse bees to cover the brood. So uh, I got some dry larva out of that. Okay, so so watch, and, watch what happens, Carol. Let's okay, I'll just pay attention. Great. Thanks. I mean, so somebody at Julie asked, um, even if they notified her, wouldn't they spray and kill them anyway? Yeah, so they will. They'll spray anyway, yeah. um, Julia. But uh, Julie, but... Um, they give you the opportunity to do something in your own yard. I don't know what that would be. I couldn't do anything, but you know, but they, they're just obligated to notify you. Then the onus is on you. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe I can move it somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> Interesting question, but sad. And uh, you know, so what ends up, what ended up occurring to me, it was so demoralizing, you know, to go, this is the first year it's ever happened to me. Um, with the with the orchards, but I know well, I went to the orchard got managers and the owners that I know, and um, and they had they had they had colonies. the The owner's son works in the orchard with them, and his girlfriend wanted to start beekeeping, so she put two colonies right in the orchard. And I went over there to look at them, and they were just devastating. They were just pumping out dead bees, just like my colonies. And I looked at them and I said, 
um, you know, <laughs> these bees are that something's going on in here. And, you know, so, and, but that, that normally doesn't happen with apples, but it did, it did to me. But if you're right in the spray path, you can expect that your colonies will suffer. Yep. I know that Ted Jones, one of our uh, um, commercial beekeepers, canceled a pollination contract with an apple orchard because they would not tell him the spray schedule. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so, and so we know that they're a threat. All right, so what else? Thank you. What else so, you know, got? in some instances, I've, I've read that some folks will close up their colony for a day or two, but that, that doesn't always uh, no. seem to yield good results. And you know, you can't, you gotta be very careful about a hot day closing up a big, big, big colony. You know, so you, you know, that's, that's a sure way to kill them. You know, if, if you, um, uh, you know, are, are, you have to be very careful, know exactly what you're doing to do that. You know, I don't know what I, like I said, I don't know what I, you know, what no, I the, the, the poisons are still out there anyway. Yeah, the poisons are out there, right? Yeah, it's a big problem. I'm, I'm sorry to hear you. I'm sorry to hear that report, but I was also sorry. My yard, so the bees, you know, of course it was sunny and they start to rot. So I'm like, you know, uh, if you've got 20 colonies that are pumping out, you know, 2000 dead bees a day in front of the colony, the smell is, is horrible. It's not beekeeping, you're, you're an undertaker and it, it's just horrible. And so we'll, we'll hope we get past that. Okay, thanks for your candor. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, we got a few minutes left, not much. We're going to cut it off at eight. Um, but uh, what is it that we should be covering, but we haven't yet? So somebody might be able to think of that. What should we be talking about? We talked about the blooms. We talked a little bit about swarms. Swarm season is not over. So, you know, you're going to get swarms all through um, June. Uh, but by the end of June, pretty much it should be over. Uh, is there anything we're missing here? We talked a little bit about small hive beetles. We didn't talk about trapping them, but you should. Um, uh, wax moth, we track is this is the season for wax moth to begin. So, so I want everybody to know that. Um, I've and, seen them on the back on the outside of my hives. Yeah, they're out there. Um, if you haven't trapped yeah. queen, uh, yellow jackets. Uh, so if you have if you're not trapping your queens. Uh, you're going to have, you'll begin to see yellow jacket activity fairly soon because the, the brood will be emerging in those, um, uh, those colonies, those wild colonies. All right, what else? Bill, any, uh, any we have an extractor, pro well, Jose, we just mentioned that we do have an extractor program. So for folks that have honey, that they want to extract, they don't have an extractor. Jose will tell you how to get one. Yes. Hey, Bill. Yeah. It's me, Santo. Santo, what the hell are you doing? Man, I'm, I'm watching you. Yeah. <laughs> you are so knowledgeable. Hey, uh, <laughs> listen, I, uh, I, I was walking by my, uh, my hives and all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of hives. I have a three-quarter inch hole in the back of the of the of the hive. What do you what do you do that for, Santo? Uh, circulation. Oh, and so you have a you have a hole in the you took a perfectly good hive body and drilled a hole in it. In yeah, the back. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. All because, right. So now what? So you got a lot of bees going in and out of that hole? Yeah. That was especially one. So as I was walking by and, and uh, um, I saw them, they're all fighting, sort of fighting to get oh, in. Do you, do you, so you're, I mean, I don't want to. Uh, no, no, that's okay. You can talk to me like you want to talk to me. Yeah, I know. Because I mean, we go way back. And, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You cut, you cut a hole in the back of a, you. you drilled a hole in the back of a perfectly good super and, not going to say, I am not going to say you ruined it. Just, did you make it big enough for a cork to go in? A what, wine cork. What, what I do is I put a quarter of inch uh, screen and then I put a, a, a window screen over that. I but, would screen it. I would screen it off now. Screen it off now. Yeah, because uh, I, I, like I said, I was walking by. There must have been a few hundred bees all trying to get in. Yeah, but you but, know, but that, that colony's in trouble anyway. 
Yes. So that's an indication that's of a problem. colony that really needs help because it's too weak to defend against. Uh, it's getting robbed out. Yep. So, so uh, you got to get in there and take a look and see what's going on in there. I got a towel, you know, a bat towel. I, I wrapped it over it, and then I got the hose and sprayed and wet the wet the towel. That kind of toned them down a little bit. Okay, but then you can cork it up, right? Yeah. Or I you just, can. I just put the screen, the window screen. I close. Yeah, up. yeah, that's good. You did it. They'll come to the front now. Yeah, but I got it. I only got a small opening on it. Yeah, but that's but that colony, you got to get in there and figure out what's going on. It's either really, really weak. Yeah. It's, maybe it's not queen right. You know, there's something yeah. going on in that colony, and that that's that's a that's a hard way to find out. But that is one way to figure out. You know, that your colony's too weak. The other ones, the other boxes that you uh, didn't ruin, that you drilled the holes in. There's not a lot of activity <laughs> in the back of those boxes, is there? <laughs> no, that's pretty quiet. But you know, they were they were talking about poison. Uh, I have a couple of neighbors that uh, um, uh, put a, a weed killer in the in the lawn to kill the to kill the uh, dandelion. Oh, like Roundup. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. And you could see the dandelion all wilt, and as the uh, Bees were coming back. I, I had some couple strong hives, and now they're not that strong. Actually, my whole my whole hive, uh, my whole thing is uh, not that strong anymore. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't, I don't understand uh, people that want to kill dandelions. I, I, yeah, I know. I just don't get it. But yeah, I mean, okay. So, and your bees may have forged on those dandelions. They were working yeah. dandelion pretty heavy this year. And they may have brought some toxins back in it, but that's probably Roundup. It's, um, but it, it, we used to think, and Ralph was a big advocate of this at one point. He would say, oh, we all agree that Roundup's not poisonous to bees. He would hold us sort of hostage at different uh, bee yards and stuff, he would say. And I would have to, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to, I'd have to, he made me agree with him one time that we did. It's an herbicide. Wasn't a it's an herbicide. It's not a, it's not a pesticide. Yeah. And so, and, and when Ralph, when Ralph first, uh, advanced that uh, uh, I'm not it's a good theory it, but it doesn't have any science behind it we've learned since then through with real legitimate peer-reviewed science that there uh, there is that herbicide has a sub can have a sublethal event and a, and, a, and a synergistic effect with other hive components that make it a little bit can make it a little bit more toxic so although I agree with Ralph it's an herbicide if it gets inside of a colony, it uh, sometimes acts with other chemical agents that are in the colony to give bees, it's a little sublethal effect. So we won't kill your colony outright. But, well, let, uh, let me add a little, uh, being a, a sailor in, in Vietnam, they spread Agent Orange. Well, that's different. Which is Roundup, which is a herbicide. So- I we, think you're- we got carcinoma from the water and we got carcinoma from the air. <laughs> I know. Uh, well, so, but your problem in Vietnam wasn't Agent Orange. It, it was the napalm that they were, uh, th that was what the big toxicity oh, was. Eight, no, 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 no. These are all related to Agent Orange and the drift. Yes, 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 I know. But I mean, but it was, uh, it was, well, me and you will talk about Vietnam later on. Okay. But um, so, so the lesson here is to make sure that um, that you pay attention to a bee colony, especially that has a lot of activity around any kind of entrance that you have um, with all the good intentions drilled into your box holes or things like that. And if you've got a lot of them and you don't see any pollen going in those holes, and you just see bees, a lot of active, look like agitated bees are in and around and fighting on that, in that hole. You've got robbing going on. And during a flow, you shouldn't have robbing. So, um, and I consider this to have, there's a flow out right now. So you should check that colony to see what's going on inside of it. Okay. All right, Jose, take yes, it away. So for those who are ready to uh, spin out some honey, uh, probably uh, 
the earliest probably towards the end of June or so, but those of you who are ready, uh, we do have a, an ex, we have an extractor program. We have extractors for rent in Windsor Locks, Eastford, Litchfield, uh, Southington and Clinton. And if you're uh, near one of those locations, you can rent the extractor for $25. And it's a $25 deposit, which you will get back when you return it nice and clean. Uh, but it just costs $25. Uh, you should go to our website, uh, ctbs.org, and we have a tab called Beekeeping Resources. And under that tab, you will see the locations and the contact information for each of the individuals who are uh, responsible for coordinating the extractor rentals in those towns. Again, Windsor Locks, Eastford, Litchfield, Southington, and Clinton. Um, and that's it. Cool. Hey, hey, Bill, last question. Go ahead. You got you got queens for sale, or does Mark have queens for sale? Or? Mark or Byron will both have queens for sale from now until whenever. Okay. Now I have um, I have I did some grafting with Mark uh, last weekend, and I brought home a cell bar of my own and started. Uh, so I'll have cells and I'll made out cells. I'll have like 10 queens or so uh, by the end of, you know, as soon as they made out. So I'll have some that I raised also. So, and, and they, but they're, for, and they're from extraordinary queens. Uh, they're from an, from an extraordinary queen. So um, I'll, I'll give those away. When I get them mated, I'll let folks know that they're available and um, we can have a party over at my house. Um, you know, as long as Anthony's um, willing uh, to bring his uh, his queen along, we we should have a uh, good time. He won't do it. He left. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. Thank you. May I ask All right. One Anything else? Bill? Yes. Um, if you were me, what would you do with the hive this year? I wouldn't do anything with it. I would just watch and so see what occurs. So. Okay, and next year, take the same hive and just try to find another place, maybe longer open space or just check around and see if there's a place where I could set up a hive. Yeah, I mean, and you're- not to give up beekeeping. I know, I know you're not- I bucket um, list. Gotta do it yeah. before I get 80. I know, I know. It's not that far off, Bill. <laughs> no, I hear, I hear you, yeah, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, you gotta you gotta find you might have to find another location to keep bees or keep bees with somebody else that's not near you, you not near that location because you're sounds like you're squeezed, especially with that apple orchard. Right. So just let it play out this year and see what happens to the colony. Okay. Maybe better. So Bill not. wants to know something about my uh, my deep boxes. Oh, all right. So okay. So you guys are having a conversation. I think we're out of time, Jose, or what? We are out of time, it's 8.01. All right, we have a workshop this Saturday that I'll be conducting at the Massaro Farm. Now I wanna make um, a commitment to folks that have watched some of our videos up on YouTube. I'm, I'm announcing in this meeting and we'll be announcing going forward that the quality of our videos will change dramatically because we have come up with a new plan on how to actually film them. So what, what's occurring in our Zoom sessions is the, cl the cloud recording, if it's not in a situation like this, if we're, if we're relying on Wi-Fi or, um, or LTE to run a Zoom class way out in the field somewhere, it's just horrendous. And you can probably watch the class, but then we tried posting some videos that were, they, they become even lower quality once you, uh, once you download them from the cloud and try to put them up on YouTube. So what we're doing is we are gonna stay with the same setup when we actually have our workshops, our Zoom workshops. So you're gonna see at the yard a not so pristine transmission of Zoom. So it won't be as good, but you will be able to see in excruciatingly uh, great grand detail 
a video, which we will video separately. And then we're going to post that video. So we'll have, we'll have a Zoom session going and a videographer going at the same time. The videographer will have a, a quality video. Then we can then just upload on YouTube. So, you know, if you watch, if you, if you happen to come to Saturday Zoom session, which I encourage you to do if you can and want to, and you miss something from the quality of the Zoom, I'm tell, I'm going to, I'm just saying to you, don't worry, the actual clear, crystal clear video will be on YouTube immediately following the um, transfer of our, our shared uh, data between uh, our video people and, and me. All right, so, and we're going to go back and replace a lot of the low quality videos with uh, qualities, with videos with the same content but are shot with um, with a better camera. All right, so, all right, we don't want to get a bad reputation for having horrible videos up on our YouTube channel. And go to our YouTube channel and and, uh, and uh, you can see some of those videos if you want to. <laughs> okay, all right, anything else? Or right, we're going to go.